What is going on guys? Welcome back to the algorithms and data structures tutorial series. Today we're going to talk about the second algorithm for sorting, which is the selection sort. We already mentioned it a little bit in the first couple of videos where we talked about what algorithms are. And today we're going to go in depth on selection sort. So let us get right into it. So as always, we're going to start by looking at the intuition here. And the intuition is a very simple one. Selection sort is what we're going to talk about today. The selection sort feels almost like a reverse bubble sort. So remember in the last video, we covered bubble sort and we had a list that's say four, five, uh, one, three, six, two, whatever. And in bubble sort, what we did is we compared the two neighboring elements every time. So we had four and five and we compared them five and one, we swapped them. And after one iteration, we always had the maximum element at the right, at its right position at the maximum position. So six was done and we only had to look at the rest of the list. Now selection sort works similar, but in the opposite way. So what we do is we scan the list, we go through the list and we scan this list for the smallest element for the minimum element in this case one. And what we do then is we put it at the first position. So we swap it with the four in this case. Um, and what we have then is one, five, four, three, six, two. And after one iteration, the first element is already at its right position and we can ignore it. And we have uh, n minus i, uh, n minus one elements to sort. So this is the basic intuition here. So what we do is we essentially go ahead and say, in, in the list in the beginning, what we do is we say, okay, I just assume this is my minimum element. So four is my minimum element and zero is my minimum index. So this is the position we have zero, one, two, three, four, five is an index. And what we do then is we go through the list and we find the smallest element or we find smaller elements in general. So in this case, it's a little bit um, unfortunate because we don't have any smaller elements uh, before we get to the minimum. But let's say this was something like two here, uh, then two would be considered the smallest element until we get to a smaller one. But now we go here uh, through the list and we see, okay, five is larger. So we don't care about it. One is the new smallest element. We see, okay, one is smaller than four. So what we do is we essentially say, okay, one is smaller than four. So the new minimum is one and uh, it is at position three right now, uh, two right now. So we swap it and then we have one, five, four, three, six, two. And then we continue on with the rest of the list and we do the same thing until we have the list sorted. So essentially it's like a reverse bubble sort. You always have one less element to care about after each iteration, but it's not the maximum, it's the minimum element. And the way you go about it is also not the same because you don't compare two neighboring uh, elements all the time, but you actually look for the smallest value and then swap it uh, with the position of the former smallest value. So this is what uh, we do in selection sort. So as always, let's look at the pseudocode to see what's going on exactly behind the scenes. And for this, we're going to create a list here. Let's say it's uh, five, three, two, four, one, six. This is the list that we're going to deal with. And you can see we have the function selection sort here with the parameter list, which is the same structure that we had for bubble sort. And then the first thing that you see is the loop here that goes from zero to size list, which is n. But we're going to talk about the runtime complexity in a second. We're just going to look at the code now and what it does. So then we have two variables here, min value and min index. So let's just go ahead and write these down. We have the variables min value, minimum value and minimum index. So what we do here naively is we got, uh, we get into the list here and pick the first element. Oh, sorry, uh, we pick the first element here in this case five and just say naively it's the minimum value right now. Okay. And the index it's at is zero. This is what we do. And then we have a second loop here for J equals I to size uh, list, which is going from I to N. And in this case, it starts with zero as well. So uh, we just go ahead and say, okay, if the current element is less than the minimum value, we're going to consider it the new minimum value. So we go ahead and say, okay, five is not less than five. It's the minimum value itself. Um, so we just skip this and then we go through three. Okay. Three is less than the minimum value right now. So we can see, okay, uh, list J, uh, since J increased by one, we're going to, uh, we, we see that three is less than two. So what do we do? We enter this if statement here, this if block and see, okay, then the new minimum value is three. We cross out five and we say three is the new minimum value. The index is one. Okay. Then we go ahead and say, okay, now we have two compared two to three. 
Okay, two is the new minimum value because it's less than three. So we just go ahead and update these values. Then we go to four and we see, okay, four is larger than two. Uh, so it's not the new minimum value. We just skip this one. Then we go to one and you see, okay, one is the new minimum value or is less than two. So it's the new minimum value and it's index zero, one, two, three, four. And then we also ignore six because it's larger than one. So at the end of this loop, we have the last statement then, which is swap list I and list minimum index. The list I is the current uh, index that we're looking at, which is zero. And then we also have the minimum index four. So we swap one and five and we end up with a list that looks like this one, three, four, uh, run one, three, two, four, five, six. Then what we do is we increase I by one. So at, in the same way that we did with the bubble sort with the last and uh, with the last element in the bubble sort, we now ignore the first element in selection sort and we're only looking at this list here. So uh, we ignore the one completely. And what we do is we say, okay, the new minimum value is I so or at index I. So what we do is we just say, okay, the new minimum value is obviously three and the index is one. And then we repeat the same process. We go through the list, find the new minimum value, swap it, and we continue on and on until we get a sorted list. So let's go ahead and analyze the runtime complexity of this pseudocode here, this algorithm, which is very easy actually in this case, uh, because what do we have here? We have a loop that runs n times, then we have another loop that runs n minus one times, obviously, because we're going up until n started i, so it's n minus i times. Um, and then we have primitive operations. We have two here. Okay, that's <laughs> so now two here, two primitive operations here. Then we have three primitive operations inside of this loop. In a worst case, of course, uh, we're assuming that we're entering the if statement every time. Uh, this is the worst case uh, of three primitive operations per iteration. And then we have a uh, swap list, which is one primitive operation. And uh, this one primitive operation actually belongs to these two primitive operations because they're in the same loop. So what do we have exactly? If we look at it, we have uh, a definite amount of three n primitive operations. Why? Because this loop runs n times. So we have three primitive operations, um, three times n primitive operations, three primitive operations with each iterate uh, with each iteration. Uh, and we have n iterations. So we have three times n primitive operations. And then we also have three more primitive operations. But how many of them uh, is the sum, then we have again, the sigma notation here, the sum of i equals zero up until n, uh, the sum of n minus i. So we can now go ahead and put this term again into Wolfram alpha. Um, and we're going to see n minus i from i to zero, uh, i equals zero to n. We have n times n plus one. And now we can go ahead and write it down like three n plus three times n times n plus one halves. So in a sense, we just have three n plus three n squared plus uh, 3n divided by 2. And we could just go ahead and multiply this by 2. So we would end up with uh, 6n plus 3n squared plus 3n divided by 2, which is uh, 9n plus 3n squared divided by 2. And this is just the exact amount. Uh, essentially, we just have a runtime complexity of big O n squared because that's the largest, uh, largest exponent here. So it's a runtime complexity that is quadratic and again, not a very efficient sorting algorithm. So that's it for today's video. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and hope you learned something. We talked today about a very inefficient sorting algorithm again. Uh, one more of those, we're going to cover one more, we covered bubble sort, today's selection sort, and next time we're going to cover insertion sort, these are the three, or three of the very inefficient sorting algorithms that have quadratic runtime complexity, worst case. Um, and we're going to see why these are uh, not as good when we compare them to the divide and conquer algorithms like merge sort and quick sort. We're going to cover these first so that you can see later on why it's important to have pseudo linear time, how we can have pseudo linear time, because now we always have like two loops, 
um, that run n times n minus i times n minus one times whatever, which ends up in a quadratic runtime complexity. And we're going to see how we can work our way around that using so called divide and conquer algorithms like merge sort and quick sort. But these uh, algorithms that we're going uh, that we're looking at right now are important to see how to not do it and why it's so complex. They're easy to analyze because uh, we have simple pseudocode, we can just analyze them. When we look at merge sort, for example, we're not going to have a simple pseudocode, which is why we're going to focus way more on the intuition than on the runtime complexity analysis, the exact runtime complexity analysis of the pseudocode. However, uh, thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.